it's a beautiful song because one day in heaven, everybody will be crowded around the throne of God and we will sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And we will sing it over and over and over again. And when you think you're going to get tired of it, you won't. Because you'll be looking at God face to face. And that's going to be a beautiful day. It's going to be a beautiful day. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hey, um, I want to point out something to you before we get started. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but our baptismal has been here for six weeks in a row. We've baptized. Yeah, thank you. We've, we've, we've seen nine baptisms in six weeks, and we have more to come. God, this, guys, this is how God, God moves. It starts in a trickle. And we continue to cry out for him. We continue to cry out for our friends, our family, our neighbors. And it starts out in a trickle and then it becomes a flood. And that's what we want. We want one day where we just go, well, where do we store that baptismal? Because it never leaves the sanctuary. Right? Where do we store it? Well, I don't know. It's been in here for so long. Right? That's what we want. That's what we want. And even, even this morning as I'm standing in the lobby, I had a gentleman come up to me. And he'd tell me with, with joy in his eyes about how this week he gave his life to Jesus. And yes, let's, yeah, because, and you could see it. You could see it. And not only, it wasn't just that, that it, this is somebody I had known. I had nothing to do with it. A gentleman, I, first time we met was in the lobby and somebody else had been sharing the gospel with him. Guys, this is what it's about. And that's why every week you're going to hear about Jesus and that's why I want to encourage you to every week to be talking to people about Jesus. Because the greatest problem in this world is lostness. The greatest problem in this world is sin. It's not war. It's not famine. It's not mental health. It's not broken homes. The greatest problem in this world is sin. And the only, for sh the only solution, the only solution for sin is Jesus. And that's why every week you're going to hear about him from up here. And every week you need to be telling somebody about him. All right, with that, with that said, let's dive in. Let's dive in here. All right, Genesis chapter 9. We're going to continue in our series uh, out of the first 12 chapters of Genesis. But there's, um, has anybody ever read the book Pilgrim's Progress? All right, it's an old book. It was written in 1678. So you have time. It'll probably be around for a little bit longer. And it was written by a guy named uh, John Bunyan, and it's a Christian allegory about the life of a believer. And cleverly, the main character's name is Christian. And there's a portion of the book where Christian is traveling, and he's moving from the city of destruction trying to get to the city of heaven. Right? So that's, where, that's the move he's trying to make. And on his journeys, he, he's traveling across the meadow, and the ground is really soggy and hard to walk through. The path is covered with poisonous vines. He's having a really difficult time. And then it begins to rain. And it rains and it rains and it rains. And he spends the night huddled underneath a great oak tree. And he wakes up the next morning just drenched, exhausted. And then along comes a giant named Despair. And the giant Despair beats Christian, captures him, and takes him to his castle, the Castle of Doubt. And locks him in the dungeon there. And day in and day out, the giant despair goes into the, the dungeon cells and beats Christian. Just beats him mercilessly. Christian tries to sing to make himself feel better and he can't do it. He gets to feeling so bad he contemplates suicide. And then one day, one day he realizes something. And this is what... John Bunyan, the author, wrote, said, a little before day, good Christian, as one half amazed, broke out into his, this passionate speech. What a fool am I, thus to lie in a stinking dungeon when I may as well walk at liberty. I have a key in my bosom called promise that I am sure will open any lock in Doubting Castle. And he takes the key out that he's had the whole time, the key of promise, and he unlocks every door of the dungeon and of the castle and he walks out in freedom. The key of promise. Guys, we have promises from God 
that will unlock any door that you face to help you walk in freedom. And we're going to see how God lays out his promises with Noah today and how that affects your life and my life tomorrow. Let's look at Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. I'm going to pause there for a second. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. And I'm going to get the iPad out. And I'm going to remember the passcode this week. Guys, what I want you to see is this is after the flood, right? The flood came. The flood is gone. Noah, his family, and all the animals have now come out of the ark. At the end of chapter 8, Noah offers a sacrifice to God. And God was very pleased with the sacrifice. And as he was pleased with the sacrifice, God then is going to proclaim something to Noah. And what we're going to see is three times God speaks. Three times it says, and God said to them. And he's going to make three points. But what we see in these first seven verses is God is almost restating Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 and 29. Why? Because everything has been wiped away. God is starting anew. So just as he started with everything fresh at the creation in chapter 1, he does it again. And, and where I want you to see this is, so God blessed, God blessed Noah. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, let me get there here, it says God blessed them. God blessed Adam and Eve. They didn't sneeze, he just blessed them. And then he looks at Noah and he's going to bless Noah and his sons. And then he says to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Guess where that's from? Genesis 1.28. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply and fill the earth. All right. Now, if you go down to the end of this portion, I know I'm scrolling a little bit faster, but I want you to see this. Verse 7, you see the same phrase again. Be fruitful and multiply, spread out over the earth and multiply on it. This little speech that God gives starts with being fruitful and multiplying and ends with being fruitful and multiplying. It's coming from Genesis chapter 1. Why is that important? Because everything at this point is dead except for, except for Noah and his family. And God is telling them, you need to grow the population. Be fruitful and multiply. It's a good thing to do that. Just as he told Adam and Eve that it was a good thing for them to do that. And so you see that at the very beginning. It says, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. And then you're going to see down here in verse 2, they are placed under your authority. The fear and terror of you will be in every living creature on the earth. Every bird of the sky, every creature that crawls on the ground, and all the fish of the sea. They are placed under your authority. The animal kingdom is under God, is under man's authority. Now, if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, God says, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. God, there's a connection here from Genesis chapter 1 to what we see here. God is starting anew. Just as he started life at the beginning in, in Genesis chapter 1, he's focusing on life in this passage. Be fruitful and multiply. Subdue the living animals. Right? There's this, there's this idea of order and creation, but also of life. Now, God's, he's not, he, he is not thinking that the flood has fixed everything. Notice it says fear and terror in verse 2 here. It says the fear and terror of you will be in every living creature on the earth. Every bird of the sky, every creature that crawls on the ground, and all the fish of the sea. Now, again, we are to subdue and rule over the animal kingdom. God sees us as in charge of the animals. But in the garden, there was no fear and terror. Now there is. Why? Because of sin. Sin has entered the world. And actually at the end of chapter 8, even though God was pleased with Noah's sacrifice, he says, look, I know man is sinful to the core, but Noah pleased me. God sees sin is still here and sin causes fear and terror. In fact, when my family and I were hiking in one of the national parks, we, we got out and we were, we were going on a hike and about 50 yards away were three buffalo. 
Now, buffalo are big animals, all right? They're, they're just really big animals. And 50 yards, you think, is a long way, except when that animal is that big. I mean, you're talking 1,800 pounds, 1,800 to 2,200 pounds. And when we start hiking, you know, my wife notices it. She's smart. She notices it first. She, Mary says, hey, should we be worried about those buffalo? And I'm like, nah, they'll be fine. They'll be fine. Buffalo aren't aggressive animals. We're going to be just fine. Well, we start walking, and everything was fine until one of the buffaloes started doing this. And looking at us. And so I'm, I'm doing this, and I just told Mary, like, it'll be fine. And I'm walking, and I'm watching that buffalo, like, turn towards me. And I'm going, okay. If that thing starts coming at me, what are we going to do? And I thought, Lucas under this arm, Sam under this arm. Sorry, Caleb, you're on your own. And, and, we're gonna, and I said, Mary, we're going we're gonna to book it. To, there's a ditch. Just like, and because obviously at 50 yards, there's a ditch about 30 yards away. I'm thinking I can outrun this buffalo carrying two kids, right? So, right, but I started thinking about stuff. Why? Because if that buffalo gets spooked, gets scared, fear, feels cornered, he's coming at me. Not because he's an aggressive animal, but because something inside him says something's not right. And that's how sin has infected the world. Sin's infected the world so much that animals are terrified of us. That's why a rabbit doesn't sit around and wait for you to come up and pet it. That's why a deer doesn't come up and just eat out of your hand. It just, it takes off running, right? There's fear there. And that's the result of sin. So yes, God is doing kind of a restart. But it's not like the Garden of Eden entirely. But what we've got to see here is that he, he's talking a lot about what the animals will be like, what humans will be like. Why? Because God values life. And you say, well, the, why would you say that, Matt? Some of you are in here are saying, of course God values life. Well, think about this. The people reading this story the first time would have just seen God wipe out all living things, animal and human, with a flood. He just kept Noah and his family and the animals on the ark. And so you'd go, okay, well, you kept probably less than 1% of all living beings alive. God must not value life. And God is making a statement here that he does value life. And he goes on further to show it. In verse 4, he says, however, now, I'm going to pause here for just a moment. Because, again, we're talking about, about the story of Noah here, but also how it's connected with the creation story. However, meaning God has, has made some statements, he has made some commands about what people are to do. And then he goes, however, meaning he's going to make a different, he's going to say something different. He's not going to, he's not going to say, uh, keep doing this and doing this and do this. He's going to give a prohibition, something not to do. I want you to do all these things, Noah, but there's this one thing I don't want you to do. Now, think about Genesis chapter 2, Adam and Eve. Adam, Eve, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. But there's this one thing I don't want you to do, to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Chapter 2, verse 17. And so again, we're seeing in how God even formats his commands and how he, he's talking, it's similar. Because here we say, however, you must not eat meat with the lifeblood still in it. However, you must not eat meat with its lifeblood in it. There are two categories for lifeblood. One, a, something that has died and the blood is flowing out of it because, for a sacrifice, and something that has died and the blood is flowing out of it because of violence and havoc. What God is making the point here is he says you must not eat meat that is still alive. You must not eat meat that's still alive. Now, many of us would hear say, well, that's gross, and I agree. But in this culture, in this time, there are actually records of the Akkadian culture where they found some kind of, of blessing in their minds, some kind of good thing by taking a live animal and cutting a swath of, of its flesh off and eating it while the animal is still alive. And you would say, one, that's not how you treat animals. Right? Where you, you don't torture them. God's given us a ch uh, the charge to rule over them. We need to rule well. But then two, God's making a point of that's not how you treat life. Now, some, some have said that this is a prohibition of eating any kind of red, uh, raw meat. Right? And, and so some of us go in here, well, man, I really like sushi. Right? This, that's not this. 
The point is not that we can't eat raw meat ever. The point is life. That we should not abuse life. That we should not take it frivolously. Because the passage goes on and says, And I will require, God, I will require a penalty for your lifeblood. I will require it from any animal and from any human. If, if someone murders a fellow human, I will require that person's life. Think about that. God's making a statement here. He's making a statement about murder. But not just humans murdering other humans, animals murdering humans. God is looking at life in its totality because he values it. And then he goes on to give the reason why. He says, whoever sheds human blood by humans, his blood will be shed. And this is what I want you to see. For God made humans in his image. Again, Adam and Eve. Genesis chapter 1, we are still image bearers of the image of God. Every human person bears upon their life the mark of the image of God. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter if you're sitting in a chair today or if you're sitting at home today. Doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not, every human being bears upon themselves the mark of God's image. We are made in his image. And therefore we have value. And God will punish any human or any animal that takes that life. You got to think about that. God values life. Yes, there was a flood. Yes, God wiped away uh, the, the humans and, and the animals. But God still values life. Why? Because God didn't wipe away humanity and animals because he didn't value life. He wiped it away because of the sin. Every inclination, every imagination in our mind and our heart is sinful. And therefore God said, I'm going to wipe it away. But Noah found favor with God. God didn't look down and say, meh, these humans, meh, I don't really care. No, he looked down and, and he saw the unholiness and he says, I got to put a stop to this. That's why he wiped away life. Not because he undervalued it. And he's starting again. He's starting again. Now we're going to keep going here because we're going to the next portion of the scripture here. And you see in verse 8 it says, Then God said to Noah and his sons with him. Again, we're starting a new part. God's made a point. He values life. And then I want you to see this. We've talked about this word before. Covenant. Understand that I'm establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you. And I'm just going to close this up. I was going to keep it open, but I think it's going to be easier for me to explain what we're talking about here. Because that word covenant occurs eight times from now to, the end, to verse 17. Eight times. In the Hebrew, it's actually only there seven times. Guys, you go ahead and put it down. It's only in there, it's only in there seven times. You know what's interesting about that is seven's the perfect number. You think God's trying to make a point about covenant? You think he wants to drill something home? He's just talked about life and how he values it. And now he's going to make a covenant. Now what is a covenant? Some of you are going here, Matt, you're making a big deal of this and I have no idea what that co covente, covente word is, right? Like I don't know what that is. All right, a covenant is a promise that is made between two people or two groups of people. A covenant it's, it's a promise that is made about what people will do or they won't do. And so you have God looking down at humanity and saying, look, I'm about to make a promise to you. I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to promise to you that I'm going to do some things. And what are the things, what's, it, what's this look like? What's this look like? In verse 8 it says, uh, verse 9, understand I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you. Your descendants after you. That's us. So this covenant is not just for Noah and his family, but it's for us too. And then in verse 10 he goes, And with every living creature that is with you, birds, livestock, and all the wildlife of all the earth that are with you, all the animals of the earth that came out of the ark. So us and the animals. Isn't that interesting? God's about to make a promise. He's about to make a promise to us and all living creatures. Why? Because he values life. 
he values life. And the, the covenant, the promise that he makes is that he will never again destroy the earth with a flood. In verse 11, at the very end, it says, there will never again be a flood to destroy the earth. Now, if you remember from a couple weeks ago in chapter 6, this word for destroy means to ruin. And God said, as humanity, because of their sin, ruined creation, God was going to ruin them. And here God's saying, I will never again ruin the earth with a flood. So God is making us a promise. And it's tough because you and I both know promises can be kept or broken. In our culture today, if somebody says, hey, I'll be there, I'll be there on Tuesday at 9, they may not be there. And sometimes it's as simple as you, you text them going, hey, where are you? And them saying, oh, sorry, something came up. And really what happened is in their mind something better than you came up. Right? They, they go moment by moment. Promises get made. Promises get broken. Right? And, and so it's hard for us to understand what covenant means because I think the closest thing we can have to a covenant uh, in this day and age is a legal document that's signed. Right? When my wife and I bought our home, we went to the title agency and they handed us a bunch of papers about this thick. And we sat there with our realtor and the title agent would say, you need to sign this. And I'd look at the real, age, the real estate agent and go, what's this mean? And he'd explain it to me and then I'd sign it. And then the next one and then the next one and then the next one. And they're saying stuff like, well, you need to sign this, but I can't, I can't give you advice one way or the other. And you're going, well, then I got to read this thing. And I don't want to read this thing. But, right, but I do. Why? Because I'm signing something that so in six years when somebody comes and says, hey, I own your home, I go, no, no. I signed a big stack of papers, and I can point to you where it says it's mine, right? It's that legal covenant that is, then, um, that is then held in high regard by society because we see it, we, we agree with it. But with God, it's a verbal promise. And that's where we can sometimes break down. The closest thing, which I think is kind of funny, that I found to this is a quote from a politician. Go with me on it, all right? Because normally we're looking at politicians not keeping what they say. But, uh, in, the, in, in Franklin Delano Roosevelt's first presidential uh, election race, when, we were, when America was in the Great Depression, he said, I pledge you, I pledge myself to a new deal for all American people. And then when he was elected, he legitimately started a program called the New Deal. And it was part of that new deal that pulled America out of depression. Here's a man, he made a promise, he pledged himself to it, and then he did it. Now we know he's human, so he's not perfect. But you get the point, that when somebody pledges something, we expect them to follow through. When God makes a promise, he always follows through. And God is promising Noah, he is promising the animals, he is promising us... That he will never again destroy the world with a flood. And you can bank on it. God always keeps his word. God values your life and he always keeps his word. And then the last portion here, we see multiple times that God gives us a sign of the covenant. In verse 12, and God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you. And with a covenant for all future generations. So again, that's us. This covenant's for us. And then when verse 13, what's he say? I have placed my bow in the clouds and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And that bow is the rainbow. But the word in Hebrew is actually for an archer in the army who would pull back his bow. You know what the beauty is? God signs his name to this covenant by taking his war bow and hanging it in the sky. Instead of using it to cause a flood, God hangs it in the sky as a sign and a reminder that he will never again destroy the earth with a flood. And you know, the other day I was driving down the street, I drove by some fountains, I saw a rainbow. And it says here that when, when the clouds gather, like they do in Ohio, when they start to gather and you hear the rumbling of thunder and it's coming your way, God sees that. And he says, when I see the, thunders, the, the storms gathering and the thunder coming, God says, I see my rainbow. And I'm reminded, and I remember that I will never destroy the earth with a flood again. God values life, and he promises never to send a flood again, and then he signs it with a rainbow. 
the beauty of this passage is that in all of it, it is saying that God values life. God values life and he values your life. Each of your lives. To God, it's not just a totality of life. But he sees the individual faces of every person. He values your life. And we see this no more clearly than John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him will not perish. perish but have everlasting life. He sent Jesus that we would not die, but we would live, right? And then 1 John, 1 John 4, 9 says, God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him because he values your life. And then Romans Romans chapter 8, as Paul's talking about this, he says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, nor any flood, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God values your life because he loves it. He loves your life. And he loved it so much that he sent his son to die for you. He values your life. Because God made a covenant with us. As he made a covenant with Noah, he values our life, he loves our life, and now he makes a covenant with us. Jeremiah 31 talks about how the days are coming when I'm going to make a new covenant. And when Jesus came... And Luke chapter 22, he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for who? For you. Why? Because he values your life. He loves your life. And what do we get from this new covenant? But since Christ died and took the punishment for our sins, since Christ took the flood for our sins, that, and he then dies, we can now have forgiveness. We can have forgiveness. We can be wiped clean of our wickedness. We can be wiped clean of our unholiness. Like God used the flood to wipe clean the earth. And you know what's at the end of that, that cleansing? Eternal life. So now we no longer die, but we live if you believe in Jesus. You no longer receive death at the end, but you receive life. That's the new covenant. And you know what he did? He signed the covenant with an empty grave. He signed it with an empty grave. That as God looks down at the rainbow, is reminded not to destroy the earth with a flood. He looks down at the empty grave and he says, that means that anybody who accepts me will enter into my kingdom. That means that since Matt has accepted Christ as his savior, he will enter into heaven, not into the grave. Jesus' signature is all over this new covenant with an empty grave. He's made a new covenant with you because he loves you and he values your life. This week I was reminded of, uh, not reminded, but somehow I was talking with somebody and it brought up the question of why am I a Christian? Why am I a Christian? And as I was thinking about it, I read a story about you know, just, just the landscape of looking at a, you, know, you imagine the cliffs that go down to a raging river. And on the side of those cliffs, you know what you always see? Never fails. You always see some tree sticking out. And you're going, how does that tree remain balanced to stay right upright? How does it not fall into the, the raging river below and die? It's because its roots have dug in and hold on to the rock. And why am I a Christian? Because the rock of ages holds my life together. The rock of ages holds on to me and keeps me upright. The rock of ages has promised me that he will take care of me and he values my life. Guys, I'm not a Christian because my parents were. I'm not a Christian because it's a cultural thing. I'm not a Christian because, you know, it's just a good life. I'm a Christian because God is my rock and he's the one that holds all life together. Because he values it and he loves it. And you know what? 
He doesn't just love life. He doesn't just love your life. He loves your neighbor's life. And this is where we've got to meet God. Because if God loves your life, if God values and loves everyone's life, that means he values and loves the life of your neighbor next to you, your coworker, the friend you have, the family member you have, the person you meet at the gas station or at the library or in the park. God values their life. And do you remember the story of the Good Samaritan? When somebody said, who is my neighbor? And Jesus told the story about how a man was walking down the road and he was beaten and he was, he was, he was stripped of everything and he almost died. And two religious men walk by, men who would have good standing in the church, and they cross over to the other side and pass him by. But then, then comes the cultural enemy, the Samaritan. The one the Jews don't like. And it's the Samaritan that stops and takes care of the man. And at the end, Jesus says, who is the neighbor? And the crowd goes, the one who showed him mercy. As God values our life and loves us, we need to take that, lo- that love and pass it out to others around us with mercy. We need to be merciful to others because God values their life. God values life. He values your life and he values your neighbor's life. And we need to meet him there and value those around us as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we we come before you as people who are underneath a covenant. The promise that has been given to us through the blood of Jesus Christ. That we will not die but we will live if we place our faith and trust in you. If we believe in you as our Lord and Savior. And so for us who have done that here today, Lord, I pray that you would remind us how much you love us and you value our life. And you would show us how to share that with the world around us. Holy Spirit, move in our hearts today. That we would be your witnesses in this world. Of of how much you value and love us. And how much you value and love every single person. In Jesus' name, amen.